Welcome to Orioles on the Birds. This is Zach Spedden, joined as always by Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens. And on tonight's show, we're going to look at the first few games of Orioles spring training and talk about what has stood out to us so far as baseball gets underway here in late February of 2024. But first, as we like to do at the beginning of all of our shows, we want to shout out some new members of our Patreon community, and I will turn it over to Bob. Yeah, um, three more AA guys just strolled in a little bit late to spring training, but we'll we'll let them on the team anyway. Thank you for joining up, Stephen, Andrew, Micah, and Kyle Goss. Really appreciate the support. And yeah, it's a perfect time to jump in because we got Top 50 Countdown coming to a close very soon. We got some exclusive YouTube content or videos slash podcast this week. That was a week early for patrons. And if you're into fantasy baseball at all, there's a dynasty league trying to get started in the discord and that's not Patreon exclusive. So uh, check that out if you feel like it as well. And with that, now we'll get into the early action down in Florida as the Orioles begin their 2024 season. And we have already seen a few highlights beginning on day one of camp when the Orioles faced the Red Sox. Colton Kowser belting a two-run walk-off home run in the bottom of the ninth to deliver the win over the Orioles division rivals. And Nick, as I understand it, you were very excited when this happened. <laughs> yeah, uh, my four-year-old uh, liked to repeat a four-letter word that I that I <laughs> exclaimed loudly when Kowser hit that uh, walk-off home run, spring training or not. I mean, that was uh, pretty cool to see from Kowser there, especially after his uh, time in the majors last year. Yeah, a big point for Kowser mm-hmm. because he comes in in a very crowded outfield situation. We've talked about some of the challenges he could have in cracking this roster, but there's undeniable upside to having Kowser on the team. And so far with what he's doing at the plate, small sample size, all those caveats apply, but he looks good right now. Bob, what do you think was really going to be key for Kowser to possibly make this roster? Um, I think it's going to be, he's got to be more aggressive with pitches in the zone when he's ahead or even in the count. And actually that's the first thing I noticed was his first at bat on Saturday. He, he did get two good a swings off being aggressive with pitches that were in the zone, fouled him off both of them. And then eventually worked his way into a walk, which what do you know, drink Colton Kowser walks. Um, so it was a great at bat, but even more so than just the end result was just, I liked what I saw from, from the dis- pitch, the swing decisions, not just, you know, it seemed like when he was in the majors for that brief time last year, it was, I'm going to wait till there's a strike or two strikes, or if it's close, I'm going to let it go. And, and this was like, he saw a fastball. It was in the zone somewhere. I'm going to, I'm going to take a, a good hack at it. One of them was a pretty decent fly ball that would have uh, straightened out a little bit would have been another home run, but yeah, that's what I like to see. And then obviously I think he, did he walk twice in that game before the home run? Yeah, I believe so. So, and then he walked again today. Um, yeah, you just, you know, it was a little wind aided that home run, but it was 105 off the bat and into left center field, which he's got power. So, uh, I'm even trying to grow up my beard to look like him. I didn't realize he was coming in with such a, a bigger beard, but I'm trying to catch up. Uh, loved everything I saw from Kowser so far, obviously a ways to go, but I think a great start if you're looking for him to grab that fourth outfield spot. Yeah, I mean, one hit in your first spring game isn't going to be the deciding factor of whether or not you make the team, but hitting a walk-off home run is a pretty good way to make that good first impression. Like, wind aid it or not, like you said, it, apparently it was 105 off the bat, so that's good contact. And if a little wind is needed to push it over and maybe, like, boost the confidence there on day one, like, so be it. Like, it's it's spring training. I In Sunday's game, you mentioned the two walks there. And he flew out in that game in the third plate appearance, I think it was. But even that, we got StatCast data in that game. That was also 105 miles an hour. And according to StatCast, would have been a home run in 18 ballparks, including Camden Yards. So, I mean, that's good contact. Like, that's the thing when you the box scores don't tell the whole story. And so that's what I love in these spring games when watching it's one thing. But then when we also get the stat cast data behind it and you can look at stuff like that, you can really break down these spring games and be like, oh, man, Kowser, it flew out. OK, yeah, that's a good hit. That's good contact. That's what you want to see. Um, you know, it's it's still early. And like Bob said, I'm not going to make any declarations about Kowser either. But so far through three days, he's doing 
exactly what he needs to do. And he's like, he's forced the organization to keep him on the roster for if it really is Kerstad versus Kowser for one spot. We don't know that it is, but it seems likely it forced Kerstad to step up and made competition, like bring out the best in both these guys. And let's see that play out. But, you know, Kowser, I've had Kerstad on my preseason roster prediction up to this point on shows that we've done. But as everyone listening knows, like I'm a very big Colton Kowser guy. And I do think that Kowser provides different skill set that he can do some things that Kerstad can't. Like Kowser can play left field at Camden Yards at home. Kerstad can't. Kowser, he can play center field. Uh, Kerstad can't. Like maybe you don't want Colton Kowser out there if Cedric Mullins goes down and has to miss a month. But if Mullins needs a night off or a week off because he got you know hit in the shin or whatever, needs a couple of days off, you can run Kowser out there. You can't put Kershad out there in center field. So I don't know. I, I, Kowser is a more flexible type player with a slightly different skill set. And just right now, he's, he's doing everything right that you, that you want to see from him. Yeah, if we could respectfully disagree with our old buddy Connor with his outfield preview. Yeah, I think I think Kowser can play center field. Like you said, you don't want to maybe... He's not the center fielder of the future. I think we saw that speed on display uh, on Sunday as well with uh, Enrique Bradfield Jr. out there. But yeah, Kowser, it's like you said, the stat cast data helps a lot. And that was even more frustrating about Monday's today's split uh, split squad doubleheader was that we didn't get stat cast for either game. Um, I feel like I'd rather even have stat cast than a radio broadcast or even video sometimes. But uh, yeah, Kowser just stepping up, even stole base. I mean, the catcher kind of double clutched. I don't know. It might have been close if he would have just thrown it straight through, but shown off that underrated speed as well. He's just a well-rounded guy. He can do it all. He's not going to stand out as we've talked about uh, a million times with him. Like he's not going to probably hit 35 plus home runs, but he can do everything well and include uh, some center field defense. The bat is really going to be the key separator for Calder because we know, and you both touched on it, what he can do defensively. Um, that Kerstad can't. And if it really is going to come down to those two guys for the final outfield spot, Kowser is going to have to have a good sp- spring at the plate. And as I've said before, I think that the Orioles had to use Kowser more often and in ways that they didn't really want to use him initially in the major leagues last year because of injuries. And that unfortunately led to him not producing very well. And it's easy to write him off because of that, or to write him off short term because of that. But we know what he's capable of at the plate. He showed it last year when it was a very good year at Norfolk. So I wouldn't be surprised if he puts together a strong month or so down in camp. I would love to know, know, obviously, people debating the the outfield defense there with Kowser. We don't have access to minor league defensive data. And even the major league defensive data, you know, is questionable at best. You know, it's not an exact science. I'd be really curious to know what the Orioles opinion is of his defense out there in center field, because if it was like a slam dunk, this is a guy who maybe he's not an elite defender. Maybe he's not even a plus defender. He's just an average defender out in center field full time. Like that's the bat. Yeah. It needs to step up, but I mean, you don't need to see as much of the bat. I feel like with Kowser for him to make an impact and be a valuable asset, but it does just make it more difficult because you know, we're not exactly sure, but just on our, eye test and just you know our our amateur viewing of him like we can kind of guess that he's not this elite defender when compared to guys like ryan mckenna sam hilliard and some other guys like those guys are proven center fielders who can cover the ground if mullins happens to miss an extended period of time and i just i feel like from the orioles point of view like they're going to want that body there on this roster and so yeah like that's why i think i do agree with zach that the bat in this instance for cows is really going to have to stand out if he wants to force his way onto this roster because of the, the defense there but it's man it's it's so frustrating to ch- like try to put these pieces together there's always the infield when we talk about the infield and people ask us infield questions it was like i don't want to answer this question now it's like how do we get all these guys on the roster because they don't have any cows doesn't have any left to prove in triple a kirsch doesn't either like but where are you going to play them both on the major league roster at the same time. Yeah. And just, I personally, from my eye test, seeing him in the minors in last year's spring training, Kowser, to me, I don't think the major league time in center field that he showed last year, that is not indicative of who he is out there. To me personally, I've seen him get 
much better reads and cover way more ground in the minor leagues in last spring training. But bare minimum, even if he's not that guy for center field, he's going to be able to cover that left field ground a lot better than a lot of other left fielders, uh, maybe even better than Austin Hayes, if I dare say that. Um, but yeah, the bat, we know he's going to walk. He's going to get on base. He's going to get. He's going to hit higher than 115 with the batting average in 2024. And he's got power. He just showed it off, wind dated or not. Adley Rutschman was his wind dated, maybe, but we like home runs. So, yeah, I'm just I'm I'm loving what I'm seeing from Kowser and never faltered, never wavered. You uh, Fairweather fans out there on Twitter, call him up, send him back down. What do you want? Come on, here he is. Well, and Kowser is not the only player we're going to focus on tonight. And you know we're only four handful of games in the spring, four so far. So. Don't have large sample sizes to look at in spring training stats, such as they are. Don't mean a whole lot, but we still want to highlight some performances or some things that have stood out to us in the early part of camp. And we'll stick on the topic of position players and go over to Bob because Bob has some observations about some of the top position player prospects in camp. Yeah, I wanted to do a quick note. I know these guys are big names and everyone's paying attention to them, but I wanted to shout out. Jackson Holiday and Kobe Mayo for two different reasons. I'll start with Mayo. I feel like he's got off to a great start. Again, it's process over results, at least from the games I was able to watch over the weekend. Really had some good at-bats. He walked at least once, maybe twice. I know he got hit by a pitch. It was a little scary, but it was a breaking ball. It didn't seem to bother him too much. He had a double, but it was really a, a pop-up that the third baseman mishandled. But he had two pop-ups and just got under a ball. Uh, but also had great at bats the whole way. And then today in the split squad, I think he was two for two with uh, a walk, another walk as well. So just like to see that that fast start for him, get comfortable, have a little success, even if the double was uh, a little bit luck. You, you want to get that early success, feel more comfortable, and then he can play his own game. And then Jackson Holiday, I just wanted to declare he's on the team because the Orioles are treating him like he's on the team. Uh, first game of the spring. It's all 2023 guys returning except for one, Jackson Holiday, uh, who was out there at second base, batted six today in the split squad game against the Braves. It's just he's being handled like he's they're like, we're getting him ready for second base. He's only going to play second base in camp. That's purely because he's going to be playing second base March 28th at home against the Angels. At least that's the way I'm reading the tea leaves. But bare minimum, he's getting a very serious run with uh, the first, you know, tier of guys that are going to be out there. Uh, so I don't know if you guys agree with that or not. Yeah, the, just because it, with Jackson Holiday, just because it's not like it's it's not like oh we're putting him in here early in these early games to get some at bats, to get as much playing time as he can before we ultimately send him down to minor league camp because he was already in major league camp last year for pretty much the entire camp. It was very late before they sent him down. So already, he already has that experience. So I agree that this is, we're getting you in games early with these guys, with these regulars, because you're going to be in this dugout with them uh, from the start. And I, that Saturday game against Boston, like I know that was the first spring game. You get jacked up because baseball is back, right? Guys you are excited about, they do something good. You're going to overreact. It's part of being a fan. I do it. Everybody does it. But like I, I agree, man. Jackson Holiday looked good at second base on Saturday. He made that nice tag to get the base runner on the Adley throw. That was smooth. I think he had another play too in that game where I think probably for a young player like that first spring game, like it probably could have gotten away from him a little bit because it wasn't like a super, if I remember correctly, it wasn't this like super easy, relaxed routine, throw, get it, throw the guy out. It was like you had to hustle a little bit, put a little bit into the throw if he was going to get this guy. I don't know who the runner was, but it was a little bit of effort in that play. I just feel like for a player like that, that could have gotten away from him pretty easily, but it was cool, calm, and collected, buttery smooth. And it, I think it's just small things like that matter when you're watching a spring game. And yeah, he didn't come up with a hit in that first game. Um, I know to Monday we couldn't watch, but I think uh, Andy Costco was saying like he, uh, I think he drew a walk sitting on a, a fastball up in the zone. So he's showing some patience, good eye at the plate. I'm not worried about the bat. The hits are going to come. We all know that. 
I'm watching the defense, and he aced that first test at defense over at second base. And I, I agree against the Angels. He's a starting day, starting second baseman on opening day. Yeah, Can't I was I was listening to the Braves broadcast at work today, and I know he had turned a double play. They made it sound like it was a, a good turn. Obviously, weren't able to see it, but that's also. You know, if if Rugnet Adora could get a, a major league job at the Orioles two years ago because he could turn a double play, that's probably a good sign. Yeah, we know the Orioles take second day's defense seriously. Not that you know, they shouldn't, <laughs> but we know that the finer details of the position are something that they really keep a close eye on. And I agree. So far from what I've seen, Holiday looks comfortable there. You, you got to remember that last year he was primarily shortstop everywhere he played. Um so he's really got to be able to work at getting regular reps at second base. It's really just, I think, a matter of him getting experience at the position because I know he can play it. If he can play shortstop as well as he does, he can easily play second base. It's just a matter of getting into the flow of a major league game, getting used to seeing the ball at the bat at that angle, and not having a lot of bumps in the road early in the year. We know that defense can go into a slump just like offense does. And I'm sure that there is going to be some, you know, rough edges to work out initially, but I have no doubt that he can play the position. And Bob, while we're uh, going to transition now to kind of focusing more on pitching, and I think the guys you want to highlight are interesting because they're kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. One of them is fighting for a big league rotation job and so far has a leg up in that race. And the other one, uh, probably going back to AAA, but looking like we should see him in Baltimore at some point this year. Yeah, let's start with uh, the second one first. Uh, Justin Armbruster, that would be, again, no data, (laughs) no visuals, but just scouting a stat line here. Uh, Justin Armbruster pitched three innings today against Tampa Bay, gave up one hit, zero walks, zero runs, four strikeouts. I think he struck out the side in his second inning of work, I want to say it was. He also got three ground outs to only one fly out. So just exceptional work there uh, by Mr. Armbruster. He's like, hey, Kate Povich and Seth Johnson are uh, starting the split squad doubleheader today. Don't forget about me. I'm right there with them. Uh, yeah, just love to see it. You know, I think he's a little bit underrated at this point by Orioles fans just because of the three guys that are clearly ahead of him. Um Stay tuned for next week with our top 50 prospect list coming out to everybody. Uh, patrons already got it, but Arm Brewster's right there. And yeah, he just, he showed out. And then on the other, other end of the spectrum, like you were saying, Cole Irvin, we're like, you know, he's going to probably going to have a chance at the rotation now. You know, hopefully he was better in the second half last year. Uh, turns out there's a, a completely different human embodying Cole Irvin's body because he came out just, two ticks up on every single pitch, almost three ticks up on his cutter. Like he was touching 95, 96 a couple times with the fastball looked in much better shape and uh, comments by him and the, the beat writers out there convey that he worked really hard in the off season and it shows. Uh, I think he even changed the grip of his slider or cutter, something he was messing around with and had good results. And he said he didn't even get to unleash the new sinker that he's been working on. So it's like John means who he, uh, he pitched two innings and he just looks really good doing it. Honestly. Yeah. Armbruster first was like the top 50 episodes we've been doing over on Patreon for each prospect. I did just Armbruster and that was probably my favorite episode to do because he's just been a guy that I've been a really big fan of from the jump. And it's really because of the development he has made from year to year. He is a much different pitcher now than he was when he was initially drafted. Um, And I just feel like the conversation again, like Bob said, we had no data, we had no visuals, we have no nothing, just the box score. So can't really say too much about his start today, except that was good to see two scoreless with a bunch of strikeouts from him and no walks. I I will just say about arm Brewster, I know when people talk about the prospect pitchers that we could see this year and they're getting excited about making some sort of impact at some point this year, obviously it's Chase McDermott. Obviously it's Cade Povich. Obviously it's Seth Johnson, who we'll talk about in a minute here. But I feel like Arm Brewster's name is very rarely mentioned. And it's like, this guy is a top 20 prospect in the system. He is also one of the top pitching prospects in this organization. A lot of his pitch data looks really good. 
Uh, maybe he doesn't have the velo that McDermott and Seth Johnson do. Maybe he doesn't have that crazy elite ceiling and you know profile that you can kind of dream on that like Kate Povich does, but there's a solid pitcher there. So I'm excited to see more from him this spring. With Irvin, yeah, that was that had the internet buzzing. Uh, that's got other pod, national podcasts buzzing as well. That was a lot of fun. I, I just mentioned like, oh, it's spring training, right? You're going to overreact and get excited about these guys. Cole Irvin is not my guy. Um, I don't know how many people are like massive Cole Irvin fans, but like this is a guy who I'm having a hard time not getting excited about after I watched that start because that was a completely different person. That wasn't like, oh, hey, we watched Keegan Aiken throw a scoreless inning and, and Brian Baker throw a scoreless inning. Man, they look good. Could could they have done something different in the offseason? Are we going to see something different from those guys? You're not. Uh, but Cole Irvin, like that was legitimate. Brand new velo, two, three miles an hour faster. He's adding like what four or five inches of horizontal break on his pitch. Like those are real, real changes that he made. And I don't care that it was against the Pirates. That was still largely the starting lineup for what you're going to see from the Pittsburgh Pirates on their opening day. And he had the two no hit innings with no walks and three punched out, three punch outs. It's yeah. I think he's going to be a very solid. You want to see it go five innings. You want to see him do it a little bit more for sure, but I feel much more confident already uh, with Cole Irvin anchoring this rotation. Yeah, I think my expectation, and I talked about it a little bit last week, is if Irvin just keeps you in games as a starter, that's a win. But he looks like a lot more than that right now. And I'm not saying that he's going to be an all-star or – emerge is you know closer to a top of the rotation guy but I think now if that's what you're going to get from him even over three or four innings of a start that's a big win to have at the bottom of your rotation and it makes you me feel a little bit better about how the Orioles are going to get through this time period where John Means is going to be out we still don't know how long Braddis is going to be out so anything you can get from Tyler Wells and Cole Irvin is going to be big for this team. And for Arm Brewster, I think it's a question of when and not if we see him in the big leagues in 2024. And people should take him seriously because he's gotten results everywhere that he has been in the minor leagues. Um, as you both touched on, the Pitts data has consistently been good, even if he doesn't have that overpowering fastball that Chase McDermott or some other right-handers in the system have. And I firmly believe he can be a starter in the major leagues. Uh, you know, for a lot of the talk that is out there about, you know, is he more of a bullpen arm? Is he going to be a long relief guy? I could easily see him being a number four or five in the majors. Yeah, I agree. He's got the frame for it too. He was throwing, I know we talked about it a few times, but he was throwing like six, seven innings towards the end of last year in Norfolk. Like just seems like a back of the rotation innings eater. They can get the job done a la, I think I said Bud Norris. I'll go with Bud Norris again. <laughs> I don't know why uh, Bud Norris is always on my mind, but uh, I feel like Arm Brewster could be a guy kind of like in that realm. Hey, did y'all ever play MLB Showdown, that trading card game with the dice and all that? Bud Norris was the man. I don't know. I had Bud Norris. Bud Norris was, I forget exactly how the game was played. Like Bud Norris was not the card, the starting pitcher card you wanted to roll out there on the game board. But man, if, if you needed a couple of good innings on this dice game, uh, Bud Norris, I believe Cardinal, St. Louis Cardinals, Bud Norris, that was your guy. Um, that That's just an arm for you. I don't know what made me think of that, but I do remember that game. That is a throwback. I might have to go on eBay and see how cheap I can get one of those. And Nick, you've got a few mm -hmm. pitchers you want to highlight. And I think that this is an interest, yeah. interesting mix. Uh, one of them is a reliever that we talked about a lot last week, but then you have two other guys who are going to be in the high minors this year that I think people should have on their radars. Yeah. Let's talk about one is in Charles first. Uh, since we mentioned him last episode is the guy who's going to make a big name for himself, uh, but probably not make the roster day one. Uh, he's living up to that because that was a really great first outing. I thought from Charles, we know he can throw hard fastball average 98.3 miles per hour. He got four swings. He had four swings, three whiffs on, I, I believe Statcast classified it as the cutter. But he threw the, the important thing, 16 pitches, 11 strikes. But I, I do think he 100% had a strike three missed call. It was like a 2-2 count, beautiful pitch on the inside. Umpire did not call it. 
So that led to three, two. And on the next pitch, I think it slipped from his hand. As soon as he released it, it slipped and was in like the left-handed batter's box. So I I'm saying he had the two strikeouts and you can take uh, what what would that be? 14 pitches, 12 strikes for Wanda and Charles. Uh, Either way, even if it's 16 pitches, 11 strikes, that's solid. And the only other report, I know we had Daniel Allen talk. We mentioned her article over at the Baltimore Banner. She wrote about Wanderson Charles as being the surprise name, the, the sleeper name to watch in camp and how his first bullpen, and I know it's just a bullpen on like the first day of camp, pitchers and catchers reporting, but it was what, 25 pitches or something. And he had like a bunch, like 20 something strikes in that bullpen or whatever that Allen Tuck noted. Take that for what you will, but. That's two really good reports, and we got to watch him in-game action against the Pirates there. And that's, to me, like, we know he can throw hard. We know he's got lethal movement on his pitches. The question is whether or not he can throw strikes. And I honestly give him an A-plus for that first outing because he threw strikes. Yeah, that was fun to watch. And if they can get him throwing strikes consistently, I mean, he's he's not going to be Felix Bautista. He doesn't have the hop uh, of Felix Bautista in the arm angle, but... Just, just could be a really nice weapon to the middle of the back end of 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 games because, well, first of all, I think the cutter is relatively new and that looked really good. But ninety eight, ninety nine, pumping it looked heavy to me out of his hand. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. The slider looked a little iffy. If he could learn a splitter from Felix, that could uh, make those mini mountain comparisons even better. But definitely liked what we saw and i love the comments even elias was like yeah i i take the odds that he's gonna be in the majors at some point this year yeah the key is absolutely just throwing strikes more consistently you go back to last year when he began the season at Bowie, we saw that from him and he was dominant there and then he gets to triple a some of the command issues he had had in the past were starting to creep into play not to mention that he was in an environment that was really kind of tilted towards hitters to begin with. But then by the end of last year, he was looking a lot more comfortable in the mound. And it looked like he was commanding the zone much better over the last month, month and a half of the season than he had been for the stretch of time that he had been in Norfolk to that point. So I feel like if he can carry that over to Norfolk, have a good first month, he's going to put himself in the conversation for a big league job quickly. Yeah, love it. And again, these early spring starts, I don't, I don't super care about some of the other data points on him. I just want to see strikes first and foremost. And so far, he's doing that. Uh, I do have two other pictures. I see some of these comments in here. The Orioles bird watcher, shout out. Thanks for watching. He mentioned Ciano Perez talking about pitchers. I didn't get to see Perez get lit up. Uh, what happened there? We didn't watch either. We Again, we had no video, no data either. Uh, no inside information about today's game. So can't speak on Perez. But did see uh, Garrett Stallings was another name I wanted to bring up from Saturday. That was beauty. Um, like, I think that per- kind of performance that he had against Boston, that was, yeah, Boston on Saturday, is the exact kind of Stallings performance in a relief role at the major league level that he can give you. Not the three shutout innings probably regularly, but with what do you have, like one walk or something? He's not going to walk very many guys. He didn't in high school. He didn't in college. And he was at Tennessee. He hasn't in the minor so far. I don't think he will in the majors either. I think he can be a really solid sinker slider ground ball artist. That's who he can be in the majors. Again, not three shutout every time. Maybe not any three full innings every time. But even if it's just an inning or two innings, if the Orioles need that extra arm in the bullpen at some point this year, I think Stallings can fill that void for you and be a ground ball guy. Hopefully he can get the ground ball rate back up over 50% like it was at some points in the minor leagues. The home runs have been a major issue for him going back to like 2021 and 2022, his first two years in pro ball. But last year they were much less of a problem. If you look at his time in Bowie and in Norfolk, like the, the, they were, the Orioles were going to cut him in 2022 when he was in Bowie, they gave him one more chance. He had a solid 2023 and now he just pitched three shutout innings in his first spring game. I just think he, it's really hard not to cheer for a guy like that because He's the type of player that has to dig deep, I think, for everything he's got with every pitch just to stay ahead and be effective. Yet he seems to do it more often than night than not. I just that was a great performance and worthy of a shout out there. Agreed. I mean, him and a few other guys, I think, could be really solid, have the potential to be at least really solid one time through the order middle relievers, like swing man type of thing, which is becoming more and more common in today's game, considering the uh 
you know, start starters aren't going as long because it's the longer you go, the less effective you're going to be when guys get more of a chance to look at you. So I think guys like him and Gene Pinto, uh, he pitched today, gave up a home run, but uh, at least he got in there in the action. But I think guys like that could be a nice bridge to the back end of a bullpen at some point for some team. I thought Stallings was better than what the pure ERA suggested at Norfolk last year given that we saw a few pitchers struggle with that jump from Bowie to triple a, I actually thought he held his own while he was there. And I, first off, I think he's going to serve a really valuable role at Norfolk this season. Cause that pitching staff, at least early on, looks like it's going to be pretty heavy in prospects and guys who are younger don't necessarily have a lot of triple a time. And I could see him being a real innings eater for the tides this year. And that's going to help out a lot. But to Nick's point, you watch his outing on Saturday and you can see the potential for balk innings relief work in the major leagues. And if he can pick up where he left off at Norfolk and continue to make strides, I could see him filling that role for the Orioles at some point this year. Love it. Cheering for him. Uh, last guy I wanted to shout out real quick, go in prospect because that's what we do here. Uh, Ryan Long, like shout out to Ryan Long. Uh, I know He's someone we've probably mentioned numerous times in that final segment that we always do in our episodes where we highlight, you know, the standout performer from the past week among the the non-top 30 guys, guys who very rarely get love. But I don't think we've ever really done like a deep dive into Ryan Long. I'm pretty sure I don't remember who said this, but I think there's a comment in the Patreon live game chat about who the F is Ryan Long when he came in the game. Uh, like the guy was a D3 draft pick with some crazy pitch data. Uh, Pomona Pitzer College, uh, which I believe is like two colleges that combine to form a baseball team because one college can't on its own or something crazy like that. Either way, a D3 pick, and the guy's got like five, six pitches in his arsenal. Of course, he's he struck out Mike Trout in the World Baseball Classic when he pitched for Great Britain. But that performance on when did he pitch? Sunday? Uh, Two no-hit innings, no walks, two strikeouts, and he hit 97 miles per hour. I think he just hit 96 for the first time in his life, like last year sometime. And so he's up to 97 in the spring game. Hopefully he can take a step forward, you know, when he gets to to buoy this year. And, and actually, some of the other numbers here. Um, sorry, some of the other numbers from that spring start. Here you go. 18 inches, because we don't get some of these lower-level guys in their advanced data. 18 inches of induced vertical break on his fastball. So he's nearing that elite that elite ride. He's got that hoppy fastball that the Orioles like. Average spin rate, 2,500 RPMs. Average 95.3 miles per hour uh, in that spring start. Change-up cutter, both generated a few whiffs, little to no contact. Pretty good outing for Ryan Long there. One of my favorite things about the spring, especially when we can watch the games and have the data, is when these guys that are like, yeah, we know him. We don't. We haven't. Whether it's Cole Irvin, where it's like we know who we think we know who he is, and then within three, four pitches, you're like, okay, <laughs> he's improved. Like it doesn't take long for pitchers to pop up as far as the data goes. And Ryan Long, a minor leaguer who we haven't really had, you know, this specific of Statcast data on. It's fun to get to see that as well. And um, definitely throwing harder, whether it was adrenaline by being, you know, in his first spring training game, whatever. I mean, it was cool to watch and it just shows the potential that he's got, even if it is as a reliever, as he's coming up as a starter in the system. Yeah, I definitely see him developing as a reliever. But to Nick's point, I think that Ryan Long and T.T. Bowens are like the go to for that final segment. Mm -hmm. I don't know that Long has been featured quite as much as Bowens has over the last three years, but we've sallied him out a lot, and for good reason. He's shown that he can be a pretty versatile pitcher in the minor leagues. He's had some opportunities to start. He's pitched in relief as well. I definitely see him in the relief role going forward, but don't let the draft status or the fact that he came from a D3 college fool you, because if you're going to look at a short list, of Orioles relief prospects that have interesting profiles, you'd have to really take a good long look at Ryan Long. And I'll jump over now to my guy and uh, someone I wanted to talk about, and that's Seth Johnson, who we're a few hours removed from his spring debut in which he gets pits against the Braves, basically facing what's going to be the Braves opening day lineup and looked really good. Two shutout innings, no hits allowed with one walk, no strikeouts, but the key thing is that his stuff in this game looked really good. If you read the game recap from Andy Costco over the Baltimore banner, 
Fastball regularly sitting 95. He also worked in a new splitter that he's got this season to go with the slider and the change up. Those are going to be big pitches, or excuse me, the slider to go with a new splitter and a curveball along with the fastball. So he's always had that interesting pitch mix with the fastball, slider, and curveball. Now the Orioles adding in the splitter, which I think is going to be really interesting to watch over the first few months of the minor league season. But some things with Johnson to note, while he still does not have a lot of minor league experience, and in fact, is still kind of raw for a pitcher because he was converted from shortstop during his years in college, he's kind of close to the major leagues. He's already got a 40-man roster spot. He's going to start this season in Bowie. And while I think a lot of things would have to break his way for him to get an extended look at the major leagues this year, I wouldn't rule out seeing him at some point. And with his outing on Monday, he's hopefully setting the tone for what's going to be a productive season. Yeah. I really, I liked reading from, from Andy's article, some of the quotes, this guy, I think uh, didn't Seth Johnson didn't surprise himself, but uh, what the quote here, he threw 28 pitches, mixing his four seam fastball with a short breaking slider, a new splitter and a curveball. All in all, Johnson felt validated. He went up against one of the best lineups in baseball and did more than just survive, which, like, yeah, Ronald Acuna, Ozzie Albies, Austin Riley, Matt Olson, Marcelo Zuna, and then Michael Harris. That, those were the six guys he faced in this spring training game. And uh, another interesting note that I know Andy made in his article, like, he came, he was at spring training last year, I believe, but he was starting his rehab from Tommy John surgery. And so, like Andy mentioned, this was his introduction to the rest of his teammates. That this is a lot of time for a lot of guys. This is the first time they'd probably seen him pitch in a game. Uh, and he went up against the one of arguably the, the best team in baseball. And yes, it was a spring training game, but dominated for two innings. Like that's he is in a unique position as well because he does have that 40 man spot, like you said. But uh, and we'll see how many innings he's going to throw this year how cautious are the Orioles going to be with him because he does have that elite ceiling. He's arguably the top pitching prospect in this organization. So I'm curious to see how the Orioles treat his innings this year. Do they hold him back to, you know, three, four inning starts in what probably Bowie, or do they let him try to go five, six innings in starts? Do they keep his innings limited in hopes of him joining the major league club at the end of the year and being that trade deadline acquisition in the bullpen guy who can throw at 97, 98 for an inning, with the slider, with the cutter, with a curveball uh, in his whole repertoire, and be a weapon down the stretch. I don't. I'm excited to see, but it's pretty darn good start to uh, your 2024 season there. Yeah, I would definitely say <laughs> I agree with you there because we know he's got the stuff. He had the stuff. It was back at the end of last season when he got in those 10, 10 innings at the end. I, I heard, I know it was minor league gun, but someone told us he touched triple digits uh, down there towards the end of of his run. We know the stuff is there. He touched 98 today. It's just, and I was actually surprised that he pitched two innings in this game. I mean, that seems like they're building him up to be a starter. Uh, does he start at Bowie or does it, does he start at Norfolk? If he impresses enough, I don't know. Like yeah. my big question is how many innings are they going to let him throw this year? And how are they going to pace it out? Like that's a big question for me. Um, but yeah, by all accounts, from the radio call for the Braves, he sounded like he pitched really well. Uh, got Acuna off balance to pop up a ball first couple pitches of the game and and was kind of breezy from there. I think he walked Ozuna and then got a double play from Michael Harris. And that might have been the one where I, I heard about uh, Holiday's turn at second base there. But uh, yeah, great outing for Johnson. And hopefully he continues to, to use it as a catapult into a, a nice season. What I see for Johnson to start off the year is that he'll probably go to Bowie initially, and maybe he's on the Justin Armbruster track where put up a good month and a half, two months, and then you get promoted to Norfolk and really just going there for refinement and to get a little bit more experience under his belt before he makes that jump because it is a big jump from double A AA to triple A. I, so far from what we're seeing, I think that he's going to handle double A seamlessly. And as long as he's able to get a full healthy season, it's going to do a lot for his development. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say this team traded for him knowing that he had what just had the time of John surgery, knowing that he had to occupy a 40 man roster spot from the time they traded for him. So he's all last year, he was recovering from TJ surgery on the 40 man roster. And this year he's going to be on the 40 man roster. 
And for the Orioles to go ahead and make that investment in him, I think that speaks volumes of how they view him. And I, I do think that as long as the arm holds up and he's healthy this year and he's producing like we think he will, I, I think he, he could make some serious noise this year in the big league level. Yeah, he's in an interesting situation where typically I think if he wasn't on the 40 man, you just want to not even entertain the major leagues with him this year. But he's already used an option year last year. He's going to use an option year to begin this year. In 2025, he's going to be down to his last option year unless I don't know exactly how they consider giving players fourth option years and stuff like that. But I would assume 2025 is it as far as options go. So if if the Orioles really want to get his feet wet this year going into 2025, I could at least see like if they're they need an arm. He's on the 40 man. Boom. You bring him up to the majors. You put him in the bullpen. If you need him, you can send him right back down. Maybe that happens a couple times or maybe he earns his way up permanently at some point. I don't know. I think that might be pushing it a little bit, but it's just one of the guys who I think this season could go a bunch of different ways. And I'm excited to see uh, which way it goes. Absolutely. We'll be following along all season with Johnson and these other Orioles prospects. You're probably going to hear more about Seth Johnson next week when we drop our top 50 prospects countdown pre-2024. We're very excited to deliver that. We will be back next next Monday night for the first part of that, and then we will release the second part later in the week. In the meantime, you can check us out on our many social media channels, including Facebook, Threads, Instagram, X, TikTok, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also find us at Substack. Orioles on the verds.substack.com. And while you're at it, join our Patreon community. Hear the last little bit of our top 50 prospects countdown and then get ready for more daily bonus daily coverage when the season begins. For Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens, this is Zach Spedden. You've been listening to Orioles on the Verge, part of the Believe Podcast Network. You know, when you're listening to a true crime story that has an unbelievable plot twist that makes you stop in your tracks. That's what our podcast, People Are the Worst, brings you with each episode. I'm Rachel. And I'm Rebecca. We're identical twins who love true crime cases that make you say, didn't see that coming, and we hate the people responsible for them. Listen to People Are the Worst now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.